And the father from my girlfriend, he just pulled this ID out of his jacket, said, I'm on the job. And this guy was saluting. Yes, sir. Go on. And then with screeching tires, we drove up to the train station. If you're 16, how cool is that? This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you subscribe in your podcast app so that you don't miss out on future episodes. Ralph Hainel tells some unique, strange and funny short stories about childhood and youth in East Germany. We talk about the experiences of his parents in the closing stages of World War II, his schooling and how he became a DJ winning a trip to the Soviet Union. Ralph is a great raconteur with virtually endless stories about his life in East Germany. Hear how he saw Fidel Castro, met the first German astronaut in space and had a girlfriend whose father was in the People's Police. Or was it the Stasi? Ralph had a passion for martial arts, but in East Germany that wasn't easy to pursue. Listen as Ralph tells us how he found secret clubs and smuggled books into the country. However, his interest in martial arts brought him under suspicion and don't miss subsequent episodes where Ralph's life takes a turn for the worst when he's arrested by the Stasi and sentenced to three and a half years in prison. Now, I could really use your support to help me to continue producing these episodes. A simple monthly donation via Patreon and you will get the sought after Cold War Conversations drinks coaster as a thank you and bask in the warm glow of knowing you are helping to preserve Cold War history. Still not sure? Listen to one of our Patreons tell you why they donated to the podcast. I'm Tim from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I support the Cold War Conversations podcast financially because the great research and the quality of the storytelling. Interested in helping us? Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. So, back to today's episode. I'm delighted to welcome Ralph to our Cold War Conversation. It was about two years after I was born that my parents, I guess for a better job at the time, moved from Dresden to Rostock, so directly at the Baltic Sea. Um, and this is where I grew up. What was your childhood like? <laughs> that, uh, yeah, this is always so, the, the two sides to it in a way. I see it now online, especially on Facebook, so many groups where many East Germans who are, let's say, say between 50 and 60, right? Oh, it was so good back then. We had a great childhood and it wasn't all bad. And we didn't have the many things, the people out of a job and companies shutting down and people living on the streets. We didn't have any of this, which is true. My childhood was great. I got pretty much everything I wanted. Um, it was safe. Um, I had every summer during school years, I was at least three to four weeks in a vacation camp. And my parents for three to four weeks uh, vacation, me getting three meals a day, all the activities, they probably paid 15 marks for it. Where people say, what today, what for a day? I said, no, no, no. It cost between 10 and 20 bucks so for three or four weeks because most was all supported by the government. So for children, it was amazing. Looking back today, what I also heard about my great grandparents uh, have to say dictatorships always take care of their children because those are the future workers, those are the future soldiers. So it was great. I had everything. Um, I could do my hobbies. I was very shy as a child. So when my parents said, say hi to this uncle, so I had my hands behind my back looking down. I could barely look somebody else in the eyes, let alone uh, tell some stories. So I thought at one point, which guy would not want to be a DJ to 
put on the music to have all the girls in front of the stage look up to you and so I learned um, I think I was 13 I went into a club it was all free parents didn't have to uh, pay anything I learned how to become a junior DJ so we learned about music history uh, we had even speech exercises so I felt almost like an opera singer with all the me mo ma all the different exercises we had to uh, produce a concept for a disco for an evening a topic and uh, how uh, to talk on the microphone in between and so I became the first uh, junior disc jockey with a friend at the time and we were so good we even became a prize from the youth organization and guess where we went in 1980 into the Soviet Union four weeks all expenses paid trip from the youth organization And for the first time in the Soviet Union, as East Germans, we were the kings. Otherwise, when I went as a kid with my uh, uh, parents to Czechoslovakia or Poland, we were always asked on the street, speaking German, do you want to exchange money? And my parents were from, from the East. Ugh, blah. <laughs> That wasn't good. But in the Soviet <laughs> Union, we were for the first time the kings. And then I had a, kind of like a cowboy hat, cool sunglasses. I even had a Levi's jeans. And so they tried to buy the jeans of our behinds. They tried to buy the sunglasses they had. I was in, back then it was still Leningrad in St. Petersburg. I was uh, doing a, a disco, doing the whole evening. Oh my gosh, we had so many fans there in front of us at the stage. It was This is how the big bands must feel how it is. <laughs> it, it was just amazing. <laughs> it sounds amazing. What did you make of the Soviet Union? How did it compare to East Germany? In all the travels that I did during the East German times, so pre-fall of the Berlin Wall, I must say that East Germany had the highest standard of living. There were other countries like the, uh, then Czechoslovakia, they were allowed, I think every five, six or seven years, they were allowed to travel to Austria and things like this. This was, of course, for the majority of East Germans, impossible. So some of them lived a little bit more free, but East Germany had, after all, due to the German-German history, the, uh, the highest standard of living. Especially in the Soviet Union, I felt it the most. We were really greeted with open arms. We had a wonderful time in Riga and in Leningrad there at the time. We saw the palace of the Tsar. We were in the Hermitage, this huge world-wide-known uh, museum. Um, it was amazing, but when it comes to... Oh, the everyday things uh, it was in East Germany quite a little bit better, even though we had to wait a long time for a car or similar things. So the stories that are known by now. How were the lessons? I mean, you, you presumably were taught about Marxism, Leninism and exciting subjects like that. Yeah, those were the two things. We had, uh, of course, a teacher. Those were the red light lessons, as we called them, um, that were supposed to turn you red <laughs> communist, where the teacher was telling us about how amazing communism is, socialism already, and communism is going to be better. And we then always said, huh, okay, so if this is the inferior lawfully dying capitalism on the other side how come they can buy everything and we have to get into line how does this work yes this is because the capitalists have drained our country until we ball, build the wall to protect us from the human traders that have pulled all the doctors and so on into the West. Since then, we had to build up our country. And it is the future when money doesn't exist anymore, when we can live a life free of 
uh, anybody who owns factories and tells us that we get a minimum wage. And so it was always the future. And we thought, okay, uh, now it's 1975, 1976 and so on. When is this future coming? And it was always said, yes, it's, it's just just around the corner. It's it's coming soon. Uh, and then where, of course, many who due to the German-German history got from relatives out of the West, Easter, Christmas, birthdays, the big packages with all this colorful stuff and uh, the nice smell of cough, coffee from the West, the perfumes, the deodorant, the chocolate was different. And we thought, hmm, how come the... Uh, Chocolate you buy in the West costs there 95 cent, and we had a store, it was called Daily Card, where you get all the delicate things. Um, how come a chocolate bar from Austria or West Germany costs here 10 marks, and over there it costs 95 uh, Pfennig? So there's something out of whack, a can of pineapple for New Year's Eve. Everybody wanted to have it nice in those days. In the 70s, they put a little bit... Uh, pineapple into the glass of champagne at New Year's Eve. So one can of slices of pineapple was 18 marks. And in the West, it was 80 cents, 18 pfennig, so uh, 80. So it was so completely out of whack that we were always questioning it. But um, you began to have two phases in school days, even in kindergarten, sometimes the really the convinced teachers that uh, were read, as we said, they are sometimes the children. When you when your parents watch TV in the evening, uh, how does this clock on TV when the news come look like? Does it have dots or does it have little lines? And then they knew if the parents watch Western TV or Eastern TV. But the majority that I know too, uh, later it was said that it was an organized mass, uh, basically travel in the evening into the West. Nobody, uh, or at least people who I knew, watched the Eastern movies or the Eastern news in the evening because if, when you heard already those phrases, the general secretary, Eric Honecker, uh, head of the this and head of this and head of that, and you think, oh my gosh, get on with it, say what you want. Hmm. And every company was always fulfilling their plan 110%, 120%. How come every company is fulfilling, over fulfilling their plan, but you can't buy anything in the store? So uh, you very early were sometimes taught, sometimes you grew up into it to have two faces. The one that when there was a meeting, uh, at work or before that, when at the school, uh, who will be victorious? Yes, our communist bloc will be victorious. And one day, everybody on earth will speak Russian. Uh, and then the reality, when you were trading matchbox cars with somebody else, Mickey Mouse, uh, the latest issues that somebody where grandma had smuggled it under her blouse on the back into the East because you couldn't smuggle magazines or you couldn't send magazines like this into it, or the latest tape uh, from somebody who was big in the 70s, a lot of British groups too, so everybody wanted to have this in East Berlin there was even a black market for records since me being a junior DJ as a teenager already I went always to East Berlin had gotten from my grandma quite a bit of money um, and she said yeah buy yourself a few new records so you went to East Berlin and Alexander Place where the big TV tower is still towering the city so there were uh, certain uh, doors of those buildings and then there were people standing there with a huge bag over the shoulders so you came close looked left looked right do you have some records yeah what are you looking for and then at the time uh pink floyd uh sweet uh 
Genesis, whatever it was, and then they look left and right. It was really like in a bad B movie. And then you went back into the parking lot or into a house, into a hallway, and then you looked into the bag. And I can still feel my fingers shaking today. Then you looked from record to record. <gasps> There's the sticky fingers from the Rolling Stones, the original edition with the zipper on it. <gasps> How much? 120. Oh, 110? No, 120, or the next one will get. Okay, it's mine. And then you took the train home and had this Rolling Stones record, and everybody, can I borrow it and put it on cassette? Or we still had reel to reel uh, tape recorders. And so, can I make a copy? Yeah, sure. Do you have something for me? Yeah, I have this latest double album from Kiss or so. And then, wow. So, that was, those were huge events. Did you have those two personalities with different sets of friends? Were, were you friends with people whose parents were in the party as well? Yes, yes. Um, I just, since I was long gone from Germany, just in the past couple of years, I looked at some of the old places. I had a girlfriend at one point and her father was in the crime squad. Uh, was a huge thing. Uh, he once had showed me in his basement. Uh, just imagine East Germany in the in America or so wouldn't be a big deal. But you were in East Germany, showed me had a safe in his basement with semi-automatic weapons in there. So I'm still not sure until this day if it was really the crime squad he was in or not. And uh, he had TV on, and on the weekends when I when I came, so I was 16. He said, just wait a moment. So he moved, removed a few books in the living room, uh, put his arm behind, and then you could hear a switch. And suddenly there were the three programs from West Germany. I said, wow, you have better picture than I have in my apartment. So, but the moment the doorbell rang, there was a run into the living room, books out, switch. And if somebody would have checked, there would have nothing but East German 1 and East German 2. So I asked him then, so how do you receive the programs? He said, okay, there is a line going out of my, not out of my window, out of somebody else's window, past the next apartment building. And at the very next apartment, their building, there it goes to the roof and to an antenna that cannot be traced back to him. Wow. So that somebody <laughs> from his work who could have checked him, this is not what I experienced. I just heard it from others. In the 1960s, there were still troops, especially after the wall was built, troops uh, from the youth organization that went onto the roofs and broke the antennas that were designed to receive West German television so that you are not exposed to the lies of the enemy. And all that we watched with my girlfriend at the time was Sunday morning. Captain Future was back then the cartoon that was the thing. He must have he must have had at least the ID from the crime squad because I was already in job education in East Berlin. So and then uh, Sunday evening I had to make it in time to the train station to get the train back to East Berlin to next morning go to the job school or to work. And one day, uh, one Sunday evening, I had cut it so short, and he said, "Just wait, I'll drive you to the train station." And then he was with his East German car pulling out of the street with screeching tires. I, I thought. Holy moly, I hope this will go well. And then a corner came, a red light. He said, hold on. And then fall through the red light. And then at one point, just before the uh, train station, there you saw the guy from the traffic police with his stick drive to the right. And I thought, ah, jeez, there is it. And then he came and introduced himself, Lieutenant so-and-so, and the father from my girlfriend, he just pulled this ID out of his jacket, said, I'm on the job. And this guy was saluting, yes, sir, go on. And then with screeching tires, we drove up off to the train station. If you're 16, how cool is that? <laughs> <laughs> wow, wow. That that sounds really cool, I can imagine. That would be really cool in the West, let alone in the East. Yeah, so I was telling this story at every 
time I could because that was something that, that doesn't happen every day. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I'm still thinking about that. <laughs> I understand that you saw some uh, famous people while you were at school. Yes, uh, my grandma was still alive and she was living along a street that was out of Rostock leading to Warnemünde. That's a little city directly at the Baltic Sea coast there where a famous hotel, it's now today called the Hotel of the Spice, um, directly at the beach where every single hotel room is directed at the Baltic Sea. So you see nothing but the water and the beach. And by the way, in East Germany, but who built it? The Swedes. <laughs> <laughs> so the Communist Party uh, had some West German cash somewhere ready and had the Swedes build this amazing hotel. And so sometimes guests of the government who... Uh, visited Rostock, which was officially named the port to the world. Yeah, can, you can imagine how this felt for us. Yeah, the port for the world who can leave this port because we couldn't. And so one day I was looking out of my grandma's apartment from the kitchen and there the first cars came, the police with the flashing lights. And then I saw, re saw already the black cars a Chaika. I don't know if you've ever seen those Soviet limousines built after the American street cru cruisers. A Soviet Chaika. If you don't know it, uh, Google it later. It's still, even today, a super cool car. And there were the first couple with security personnel, whoever, members of, I didn't know who it was yet, and suddenly there was one open Chaika there. And who was in there? You could see it right away in his uniform, Fidel Castro. Now, back then I knew very little um, as a student still. I was maybe, how old was I? 11, 12, maybe. So I was waving automatically off the, out of the window and as you have it, Fidel looked up, saw me there. Maybe he thought that's one of the meet points. So he waved his hand. So, hello. Yes. And I, and I thought, wow, that's really cool. Later, when I worked in the hotel business in the 1980s, I heard from colleagues whenever Fidel Castro visited Warnemünde and stayed in this hotel, the Neptune Hotel, he always made sure or they made sure uh, to fulfill his wishes in the nightstand. There had to be two bottles of American whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> and for this favor, he handed out his Cuban cigars uh, to others. But it had to be American whiskey. But of course, it couldn't be out there in the open. So it had to be hidden that Fidel drank in East Germany American whiskey. I guess we're all human after all. <laughs> that's a great story and and there's another famous person you you met as well yeah it was publicized as the first german in space sigmund jane back then there of uh, there of course it was suddenly the first german that it wasn't east or west but of course east germany took all the credit for it and sigmund jane as soon as he had landed i heard later the story from uh, him in a public interview, he said for him, they were waiting with the message with somebody from his family had uh, a child was born, a grandchild. They were waiting with this message for him and the Russian guy, somebody was waiting with a lit cigarette for him because as he stepped out of the capsule still in his suit, he first had to take the cigarette and a <laughs> couple of deep <laughs> Uh, puffs from his cigarette, so that's as mini side story. So uh, Sigmund Jane was coming to Rostock, and so they were looking for people who were basically on the sidelines to make sure uh, uh, he can walk through there. And since I was in this disco club as junior DJ, so we were also employed to man the sidelines and there he came and he was so yeah how to put it such a nice 
pleasant man, quiet man, you could see that he felt uncomfortable with all the trouble that was made around him. He didn't want it, but he knew he had to present. And then he came up to our corner there. It was a big conference center. And then uh, I was just nodding, saying hello. And he came up and said hello and shook my hand and said, so you feel good. Welcome to Rostock. He said, thank you. Thank you very much. That's really nice here and glad to see you thank you and then he kept on walking and thought wow i just shook the hand of a dude who was in space also again very cool <laughs> that is really cool as well yeah no, i'm i'm very envious of some aspects of your school days not not all of them but but some of them when did you become interested in martial arts Oh, that was actually very early on. Uh, it must have been almost two-sided in me. On one hand, I was never good at sports. <laughs> I think it was also my daughter who at one point said, so could I say you possibly sucked? I said, yeah, I was really bad. I couldn't do the simplest things. And on the other hand, just the images in the history books in school of gladiators, of the knights with their shields and their swords and their pikes. And so I thought maybe in another life I was some kind of warrior. So I had this enormous interest. And then it was 1977, I think. And uh, with a friend, we found out, oh, there's this judo club. Of course, karate and all of this uh, was just earlier, 1972, I think, when Bruce Lee had really become this worldwide hero with his movies. Kung Fu, the series with David Carradine had put Kung Fu onto the map. So I was still in, uh, away from that, but I knew I wanted to do martial arts. So in 1977, I went with a friend to this judo club. It was from the university in Rostock. And I still remember the very first day when we arrived, there were those dudes in those white pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> um, and with those belts and one was pulling on a sleeve and suddenly, bam, there was one on the floor. And I thought, wow, I want that. You barely touch a guy who says, hey, I, I will punch in the face and then I do this trick and bam, he's down on the floor. Yeah, baby, I want that. So we trained there for a while and with bloody elbows. And of course, if you bleed, then it's even more interesting because you can show it to the girls and say, yeah, yeah, it, it hurts quite a bit, but doesn't do anything to me. That's, that's just how you train as a man. <laughs> you know, the 13, you're already the coolest dude there is. Yeah, I mean, DJ and into judo, God, dear, you must have been irresistible. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, that's at least what I tell myself when I think back. <laughs> So then somebody told us there's this secret club. There's a really old dude. Back then I didn't think about it, but today I think really old dude is just like in a Kung Fu movie. There's this wise master in the mountains with long white hair and this white beard. Um, they just told us, he, and he does jiu-jitsu. So, and by the time I had already found out anything that was not an Olympic sport, and that you did not participate in direction of winning medals was not necessarily liked. So any sports, um, everything was directed to build future athletes. So for me, looking for a hobby, it was pretty slim. Was a pretty slim chance to find something. So we went to this guy, and then I found out, or maybe it was years later, that I really understood why he could do it. It was really an old dude. I arrived there, so that was 1978. And I was 14 years old. Now imagine with 14, you see somebody who has white hair, who has white hair and who's 70 years old. I still remember the jokes when we saw old people as a teenager who are pretty slow. So, and he, with a young, really muscular guy in his 20s, he touched him and also, bam, 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 had him on his, on the mats. I thought, wow, that is something. So there we learned arm locks, 
finger locks, wrist locks, and all the forbidden stuff that we were not allowed to train in judo. Why could he do that? He, uh, a lot of the story I found out years later, he was a World War II veteran who was in the 1920s stuck as a sailor with his ship in Yokohama. The engine was broken, and I guess in those days, you couldn't just quickly order something. It took over two years that the ship was in the port, and at the time, the uh, some of the port workers there, one or several were actual descendants of an old samurai fam family. This in itself is already the plot for a movie. And so for the two years that he was stuck in the port, he was every single day, every single day he was there learning jiu-jitsu from them. And at the end, when the engine was repaired and the ship was going back to Germany, he got a black belt from them. There was nothing in between. You didn't have yellow, orange, green, blue, brown, or any of this. You trained, trained, trained. And if you had the stuff, you were black belt and bam. A hero. So he came back to Germany. Then many years later, um, he was in a communist family, a workers family. World War II happened. He went to Moscow and was from Moscow then sent as a single fighter, he being born German, who was uh, behind the lines killing in single hand-to-hand -hand combats, particular Nazis. So I assume he got his kill orders. You cross again the line and you're German, get your Nazi uniform, and then you can kill this dude. So he did this. He was also then captured at one point, uh, was in a concentration camp, had his fingers broken and so on. He showed it to us later. And that's why he was uh, a veteran of World War II, a combat veteran, had all the medals you could get from the Soviet Union. And that's why he could teach jiu-jitsu there and nobody would have said anything against it. And um, so I learned there uh, until 1982. And at the time, um, I heard, uh, I saw an ad, which I luckily found again. This ad from 1982 I found in my Secret Service files now, where somebody else was looking for a, yeah, back then, a uh, martial artist, a judo fighter who would teach with him a club that is supposed to be initiated. Uh, so for that, I needed a certificate. So at this old man, my sensei, basically, Tribul, uh, we didn't have anything. So I went to him. I said, here for the East German Sports and Gym Gymnastics Association in order to teach in a club, I need a certificate. He said, well, you, I know you, you have trained this much, you, so you right away, we can make you a brown belt. I thought, oh, wow, the one who fought behind enemy lines, who had really used what he has learned, he thought, I'm a brown belt. Man, that's quite something. So he said, have somebody come up with a certificate. So one of my friends was into drawing and they drew up a certificate and um, I had him then sign it where he uh, signed his name Johannes Tribul, a teacher for special forces army and police in East Germany and strangely enough two of his grandchildren who were also in his club uh, when one of them turned 50. They found this certificate from me from 1982 on the internet. And since this is the only certificate in existence, one of them for the other printed this certificate out and gave it to him in memory of his grandfather. How strange wow. the world works, right? Wow. I, I agree with you. Johannes's story would make a much better movie than Karate Kid. Yes, although uh, Cobra Kai now on Netflix, I must say, it is pretty cool. So, yeah, I was, of course, honored to receive the certificate for him, and then I could uh, start this club. And so I got a 
passport. Germans have passports for everything. So I got from the East German Sports and Gymnastics Association a passport as a, a teacher for judo, self-defense, and jiu-jitsu. Nobody else has this. I've later asked. They always said no. They were only allowed to write judo in it. But this person who was at the day filling out this passport for me knew the old man and due to his service to the country, Uh, she wrote into my uh, sports teacher passport, teacher for jiu-jitsu, another only a, a single thing out of East German times that nobody else has. I also read in your book about you trying to get hold of books in like 1977. Oh, yes. Uh, and you you had a pen pal in West Germany who was trying to help you. Oh, gosh, that, that is a story. Uh, since I was naturally interested in music, when my mum will hear this podcast, so I was supposed to be in bed already in 1977 <laughs> and under the blanket. I'm sure she'll forgive you now, Ralph. I certainly hope so, yeah. Under the blanket, I was on a little uh, transistor radio. I was listening to Radio Luxembourg. And Radio Luxembourg, for radio fans, there are en enormously many, many radio friends today again, as I found out on the Internet. So I was listening to a evening show on Radio Luxembourg, the first private station in Europe uh, that was called the Super Club with real jingles as I had not even known it from uh, regular West German radio stations. So it was really cool. And there they published pen pal mailing addresses and I thought, wow, cool. I must write to a girl in the West. So I wasn't thinking about what I was thinking in the 80s that I tried to establish a contact to the West to maybe by marriage or so can I be able to cross the border. Now back then it was just the excitement, possibly exchanging letters with somebody from the other side and getting further. So I wrote to this address from that evening on the super club. And I think it took couple of months, then I got the first letter. Hey, hello, my name is Elizabeth. Uh, my friends call me Bobby and uh, my girlfriend who uh, had her address published on the super club at Radio Luxembourg got so much mail. So she handed out to all her other friends. So I'm writing to you if you would like to. And so we wrote back and forward um, it was really interesting. And so naturally, I began to mention my hobby and that there is nothing in the East. You can't buy books. You can't uh, get magazines or anything like this. Funny enough, much, much later in the 2000s, in young people, teenagers in Canada said, couldn't you have looked it up on YouTube? I said, hello, think about what time it was. <laughs> um, there wasn't even the internet there yet. So I wrote to her and then she said, you know what? I'm. Can I send you some karate books? Uh, and I, I don't know, this is as if somebody today uh, meets you on the street and say, can, you, can I pay for a two-week all-paid vacation for you? <laughs> so that, that sounded, sounded to me. And I said, oh, God, yes, yes, please, please, please do that. And um, then we thought, okay, how? Because if you sent this, I knew it from my parents. My father was at least partially in the book publishing businesses, in the business uh, of a publishing company. And so I knew that books are likely confiscated at the border. But um, it was still winter time. In the summer, said, we're going to be in Czechoslovakia again, Kalivivari, Karlsbad, really nice spa town in now the Czech Republic. said, there, those are friends of my father's. What if you sent the karate books there? Would this be an option? She, no problem. So she sent the books and then my father said, yeah, I talked to the guy on the phone, your karate books are there. And it was still a few months to the summer vacation. And at the time, I can barely understand it today. Back then, I was of that opinion as a teenager. You get karate books. Then you open them, and 
there you find those secret techniques. You do them a couple of times, and now if somebody something happens, whack, 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 bam, 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 kaboom, and suddenly some guy is flying through the air, and then you can do it. That there's a little bit more, or quite a bit more to it, uh, I didn't think of it yet. But karate books with secret techniques. I was waiting, finally, the summer was there. On the trip. Can you imagine today a teenager, a kid waiting for a gift for months and months patiently? So we arrived there in Kalavivari in the Czech Republic, then Czechoslovakia, and went from the train station to our quarters. And then ding dong, ding dong, nobody opened. My father, ah, maybe they're out. We have to wait a little bit. Then he went upstairs where under the roof, our room that we had there in the summer would have been. And then a neighbor opened he said, yes. And half uh, German with uh, two and a half Czech words, a little bit Russian in between. Yeah, we're waiting for uh, Mr. So-and-so to get the keys for up there. That's not going to happen. Why? What happened? And he had fled just with his family fled months earlier to Austria. And of course, the Czechoslovakian Secret Service at the time had emptied his apartment. Now I had waited almost half a year for those bloody karate books. There I thought I'm so, so close to becoming the great karate master. Poof, it was gone. They were gone. I don't think, uh, I'm not sure if I've ever been dis disappointed again that how something that is about to happen is then in the next moment gone. That was a tough setback. Then it took quite a few years longer, 1980. I was with a school friend, Heiko, in Poland, and we went on the flea market And we walked there, great posters with Led Zeppelin and Nazareth and Deep Purple and all of this stuff because the Polish guys knew what the East German wanted. So they had West German Bravo magazines, the music magazines. The Polish guys took photos of the color posters in the magazines and developed them as color photos. So on the flea market, you could buy the photo of a poster of a West German music magazine. <laughs> and I had them all. <laughs> and suddenly I looked there. I said, Heiko. Let's just walk past the stand as if we're not at all interested. He what's up? There's a karate book and it's in German. <laughs> Don't make a fuss here. And he, I'm not doing anything. I said, yes, stop talking. So we walked by and said, okay, let's casually walk back and do, yeah, I'm looking for other things. Yeah, what's this year? Yeah, karate. Not really interested. What it's supposed to cost? I don't know anymore. It was quite a large sum. And I was, of course, I would have paid anything and everything for it. I said, yeah, ugh, not really interested. Had to put it down. And then he called, come on, I'll, he took some off the price. Do you want it now? I said, ugh, oh. Okay, okay, if you push me, I will buy it. And then I paid the money, and I think it was <laughs> all that we both had. And I was holding it in my hands, and I was probably shaking. Oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh. I have a karate book, and I looked into it. Oh, God, here are the kicks. Oh, yeah, here are the karate chops. Oh, here are the punches, and here are the breaking tests. Oh, my God, oh, my God. I will soon know all of it. I will absorb it. I will be the greatest. So then we met his father. His father was a nautical officer on board of an East German trade ship, was just in Chechen, in the port. So we talked to him and he said, nah, look at you guys, 16 and so, they will probably, when you go back on the train into East Germany, they will check you, they will take away the book. So I said, oh, damn, what am I going to do? I said, I need it, I want to be good. Um, he said, wait, what, uh, we're still a few days in the port and we have some tiny little trip. I will 
uh, carried over. I, I know how to hide it. I'll bring it to Rostock as a seaman. I hide it in my stuff. And then this took again a few months. And he did it. He brought the book in and then I had it some point in 1980. So now uh, I was almost a quarter of a century gone in Canada, just uh, 2019 now. I looked in some boxes in my mom's basement. Did I not find this old karate book again? And then through a good friend, we visited my old school friend, Heiko, from back then, uh, who lives in the western part of the country. Um, uh, and my good friend, Sandra, she knew where Heiko lives. So he didn't know yet uh, that um, I'm going to visit because he thought I'm still in Canada. His father was there who was back then the seaman who had smuggled this book over. And so I showed it to him. I said, here it is. It still exists. And he, no way. He said, wait, I'm calling my son. I'm calling <laughs> Heiko. He has no idea. I will say it's nothing bad, but it's kind of an emergency. Come and visit me this afternoon. So Heiko and his wife, they came, and I hadn't seen him in more than quarter of a century since I was gone for such a long time. And then he came in and no way, no, no, this can't be, and hugs and everything, and was all quite emotional. And then I had to insist on it with the story. So with his father, with him, with Heiko, with whom I bought the book on the in the flea on the flea market in Poland, and his father, who back then smuggled the book uh, into the East. Now we took another photo in 2019, the three of us with this book that the story over the course of decades finds such an ending. Uh, I found this just amazing. <laughs> that must have been so moving for you. Yes, it was quite amazing. Sometimes you don't... Uh, those are the moments where you think, you know what? It's, it's cool to be a bit older. You uh, Things happen to you that when you're young, this kind of stuff doesn't happen. So th this was kind of amazing that all of this comes together. That is incredible. I mean, I'm I'm just sitting here. You know, these stories that you've got, Ralph, are amazing. They are really good stories. Can you tell me about your time in East Berlin? Berlin was anyway for East Germans um, a strange topic. Number one, Berlin was only, of course, on the eastern side, the capital. Uh, that was not the parted city. And uh, all those decades, you could always get everything in Berlin, what you couldn't get in the province, so to say. So that's why Berlin in itself always had this extra status as a city. So 1980, I started my job education in Berlin. Uh, my parents had, my father had already moved end of the 70s because of his job to Berlin. I wasn't actually really eager to go to Berlin, but I had got my job contract there and it was at the time something quite exciting. So I moved there and... Then yeah, came for the first time this feeling that I'm sometimes trying to reinstall, so to say, um, that there was a wall. And one point in particular, it is called Plenterwald, uh, where there was during East German times a big amusement park on one side, but on the other side, you saw behind the Berlin Wall a stack of new buildings, and you could see the people on the balconies having their morning coffee, something like this. And I remember early on looking there and saying, but they're alive on this side as we are. So this is the supposed, as they told us, the anti-fascist protection wall, supposed to protect us from the bad, from the other side. Hmm, how come that the people who are supposed to be bad can travel into our country, but we cannot travel to them? Number one, that all the border installations are directed at us, but not at the ones who are supposedly bad. 
hm, das ist quite strange, so to say. Then, of course, with the same school friend, actually, Heiko, 1980, we, at the time, uh, I think I found a concert again on YouTube, was a concert announced with Barclay James Harvest at the time. So we uh, drove on his motorcycle to the Brandenburg Gate and how much closer can you get to the Berlin Wall and have this feel of, okay, there is a world behind it, but unless we turn 65, then we can travel. This world uh, we're not going to have access to. So it's there, but it might as well be not there. So we wanted to listen. We heard already some of the concert, and then we felt, uh, no, there's too many of those Uh, suspiciously unsuspicious people standing in groups of two, those young men who have leather jackets or blazers but a tie underneath. They don't talk to each other. They don't look at each other. Uh, some groups started to already control IDs. We thought, nah, let, let's take off here. So we drove off on his motorbike and shortly past the Brandenburg Gate, He said, you know what, uh, got to stop, want to look at the map, how we make it best to the Autobahn. We drive into the side street. Sheesh, this, this is again movie scenario. Just imagine buildings left and right of the street, no windows. And at the end of this little street, let it be 100 meters, is the Berlin Wall. So we stopped there and it felt kind of eerie. I said, look quickly onto your map and then let's get out of here. And suddenly in one of those buildings, there was a door and a policeman policeman came out of it. Uh, blah, 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 his, uh, his rank, uh, lieutenant, whatever he was, so-and-so, what are you doing here? Uh, and I could, uh, yeah, the engine, I think, just made a little bit trouble. So I wanted to look at the map where the next gas station is in case I need a mechanic. Hmm, hmm. So on the, his uh, army boots, so whipping forward. Okay, IDs. And then he wrote it down. What are you doing here? You, have, uh, you wanted to listen to the concert? No. Oh, no. No way. No, it was just purely accidentally that we drove by here and had to stop here to make sure because you want to be a good member of traffic and not that the bike breaks down. Jeez, whatever we mumbled there back then. So, and then we drove and we thought somebody's following us and uh, we were both 16 and I think we both drove off in direction to the Autobahn as if the devil is behind it. So this really stands out as one of the first encounters of the border. Then it happened in a train between Rostock and Berlin Nine, yeah, must also have been 1980. There was from the ferry that came over from Denmark, two wagons were uh, put onto a train, were attached to a train that continued then from Rostock to Berlin uh, with people coming from Denmark. And at the time, I didn't think of it, walked through, met um, old young lady there, and we just ended up chatting. And uh, then I noticed, oh, gee, she had uh, sat in the wrong wagon, the one that's only for the Western people. Um, but we had, uh, she had her cigarettes out, chocolate and so on. Um, when the uh, train conductor came through to check the ticket, so he didn't say anything. And we just started chatting away, and we ended up later meeting again. Um, where she came over with her husband, and this is how, for the first time as a 16-year-old, I started to wait at, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard anything about the Palace of Tears in East Berlin. Are you familiar yes, with this I term? Yes, I have. I've, I've, I did go through it. I, I went to East Berlin in, in 1989 before the wall came down. Okay, then you know it live, this, this crazy building. Yeah. So, and this is where for the first time I had people come from the West over. I was waiting there. They came and they were afraid of the border crossings as West Berliners. She had smuggled 10 West German marks in her boot. 
uh, where uh, I even you I said you're from the West. You're supposed to bring money over. You what they want the communists want that you spend your money. The more you spend here of West uh, of your Western currency, the more they can put into their own pockets. So you don't have to smuggle this. But now uh, the strangest thing then in the evening going back, and then you see the cameras. No walking beyond this point here, only for diplomats. And then this, geez, you have to say goodbye and you will never be able to meet those people at their, in their homes, at their place of work. They told about their everyday stories. We shared the similar everyday stories, but we lived on two different sides of the Berlin Wall. They can travel. They're afraid of it, but... I am not afraid, really, but I can travel. So and this was always, it uh, It was never something normal. It was even worse years later when my, fir- my second Kung Fu teacher came over. To, so in 1982, I was still in job education. So I, for a theory paper that I had to write, I was invited by the service master from the hotel where I did my education. And he lived in Berlin, Trepto, that's a part of East Berlin, where from his balcony you could look down onto the wall and where the building across the street was already West Berlin. That was the only time that I actually saw this when he got the champagne from the balcony. He said, oh, can I just look out? He said, yeah, don't uh, look too long. Otherwise, I have to fill out a new form tomorrow. Who visited my apartment? Because they take from the watchtower a photo of you. If you're longer as a second uh, and a half on the balcony, then I have to write a report. So I saw it for a moment. I saw, I still have this image of this guard tower. Uh, Any regular street where you can almost... Uh, do you have some sugar for me? And yeah, and you can throw it from win- one window onto the other side into the neighbor's kitchen window, so to say. And then I saw the wall and down there, all of this, this, I don't know, as if you look into an abyss that was so unreal. And he, uh, I guess, uh, was used to it by now. This was probably the worst Uh, meeting or the worst experience seeing the Berlin Wall. And this is where it started to rumble because a lot of uh, um, people who I shared this job education with, they were Berliners. They had all kinds of strange connections into the West. Some of them were already uh, selling at the time those first digital watches where you could set an alarm for the morning and you had a little melody running for Elisa or so, um, where I bought one. So, and then I walked up with my mom. We wanted to uh, do some shopping. It was East Berlin shopping street, but just around the corner, you could at the time still see something of the Checkpoint Charlie, probably the most famous border point in human history, I would think. And when you looked across past all the installations, they made it very difficult. You could see on the West Berlin side, on the side of the building, a clock. You could see some neon signs. And I thought, this life dead is so close. But if you try to get there, you either go to jail or you get shot. How can it be with human beings that it is impossible? At the time I was 16, I would have needed to wait almost 50 years, half of a century to, as a retiree, be able to travel across the border. And my mom looked at it and she told me, boy, Get this out of your head. This is our reality. This border will be there forever. This is how life is. We cannot change it. Nobody can change it. It is not going to be changed uh, through anything. This is it. You have to live in the reality. Whatever you might be thinking, get it out of your head. Forget it. Wow. 
Yeah, she was probably thinking that if you think about trying to escape because you had heard a lot, there was there were always again evenings, especially in East Berlin, where you could on the TV get the West Berlin evening news, where then evening news it's um, half past seven here from Free Voice in the Free City, the West Berlin evening news, as we have heard last night, another. Uh, attempt has gone bad somebody tried to climb the wall reports came in from police and from pe people living nearby that shots were heard nobody made it across the wall let's be here in the free world again aware of how good we live and let's hope for the family of this poor person that everything will end well and you always had it in the back of your mind that It did happen. People tried to flee. People tried to prepare to flee. You, it was this kind of. Uh, it's it's a lust for. It's a wanting. You want to be able to make your own mistakes. You want to be able to do things, and even if they go ten times wrong, it is you who who is doing it. And if it goes wrong, so what? But we were told. Uh, still in school, doing job education in East Berlin. Uh, anyways, we were told, you don't want to be there because so many people are on the streets and people take drugs and there's prostitution because they can't pay their rent. That all of this is happening, yes. But later, much, much later, I found out, yeah, there are no people on the streets in East Germany because everybody who would be on the streets is in jail. But this is a very different topic. This I learned much later in the 80s. I, I suppose your mother was also possibly thinking about, you know, your mental health there, that you shouldn't become obsessed with the West and you should, you should just accept that this is your life in the East. Yes. Yeah, I, I don't know what I would have said, done as a parent. Your colleague who lived in Treptow, he must have been very trusted by the state to have a flat right on the edge of the wall. Yeah, back then I didn't think about it at all. Later I thought, uh, by what we know now, that in those few buildings left that everybody was checked so thoroughly, but he must have been a very trusted person. Yeah, presumably there weren't any extra checks coming into the apartment building. Um, not at the time, and since I was only a few times as a visitor there, it didn't happen. Uh, now, I must say, since I just had the opportunity last year for the second time to read my server, Secret Service files, and it made me think about what you just addressed the very first file that had been collected by the secret service was a letter from a, a summer job i had between grade nine and grade 10 so i wasn't even 16 years old that is in my secret service files which makes me think why How and why did they start so early to collect stuff about me? There was just this company uh, where I did the summer job. Okay, we had uh, contact to Westerners. Uh, here in Rostock, there were always uh, very big events and orchestras from Sweden, Denmark, Norway came over to do here the show orchestra thing on the street. And all I can say is, yeah, I was 15 and most in those orchestras were girls and they were the, the Swedish girls with the long blonde hair. So I had to have the summer job to uh, deliver uh, goods and lunch packets to them to talk them up and so on. So I had to do this. And maybe this is how the company who wrote that I did a good job during the summertime when I was 15 years old, that this is in my Secret Service files. So maybe that's why I didn't get an extra check then in Berlin Trepto. <laughs> Going back to your, your martial arts interest, how did you move from jiu-jitsu to 
and hopefully I'm pronouncing it Wing Sun Kung Fu. Yeah, that, that was a, it was in the end accidental, but I was early on. I wanted to find more material. I wanted to have books, anything I can learn from. So since 1980, this one karate book had finally made it across the border in this adventurous way. I had then started to place newspaper ads. Um, I'm looking for books about judo, karate, other martial arts, and had placed them in different newspapers. Sometimes it's good that people in offices... Um, don't know all the regulations. I still remember a couple of times that I was asked, can we even publish this? I said, oh, yeah, I did this already with the newspaper then East Berlin, and they cleared it. It is okay. Oh, okay, then it's good. Then we can publish. And I assume since it was published, she didn't ask her boss. So I had those little newspaper ads in, paper, in papers. Initially, I had a lot of old people write to me, and they said, I found this old box, and I still have from 1926, this old jiu-jitsu manual, this uh, booklet found, are you interested in buying it? When, of course, it, am I interested? I'm already on the way. Of course, it wasn't as quick <laughs> as we tell the story today because this was letters, writing letters back and forward since we couldn't talk on the phone, since most people didn't have a phone. So I began to buy old pre-World War II books, and I got then even one uh, Berlin jiu-jitsu instructor. After his school was bombed during World War II, he had on the hand press done single pages of instructional letters to his students during those war times, and in East German times from an old collector, a man who was yeah, way past 80 years old, I got the full set that was sent during the World War II days out to Jiu-Jitsu students. I have the full set even today with the original signature. So that's another little pearl, the little story that connects everything over the decades. And so I got other martial arts books and some of them contained addresses of the organizations and I always started to write, hey, I'm Ralph in the East and so I'm really interested in martial arts and typically nothing ever came. And then from the Wing Chun Kung Fu book uh, was the first time I got a letter of the chief instructor, Keith Ronald Kernspecht. So at the time I didn't know him yet. So uh, he sent a letter that's really great. And can you uh, visit my Chinese teacher? He's uh, in the summer giving a seminar in Yugoslavia. And I thought, oh, geez, you people in the West, you have no idea. <laughs> we can travel even to Yugoslavia because Yugoslavia was the most Western country of the Eastern Bloc. So I wrote back to this teacher in the West. I'm very sorry, but I can't even travel to Yugoslavia. Um, what can we do? Do you maybe have some books? So he had then sent me some magazines, member magazines he had, and they even made it through. I was surprised myself. And then he said, would you um, invite one of my students? I thought, oh, oh, wow, a Kung Fu teacher is coming to this. He said, yes, of course. And then it did still take some time. And then I managed to invite him and he came. We had started the training, the Swing Chun Kung Fu style in 1984. I had the first people in my apartment. We did from the book all those exercises. Uh, I wish there would be some secret taping from the Secret Service that I could see what we did back then, but we were so full of energy and enthusiasm and willpower to do some techniques for hours and hours, uh, something that almost doesn't exist anymore today. But if you can get something that doesn't exist, you move mountains. In February of 1985, he came across... So we were uh, from the inner circle because I couldn't uh, invite everybody. I still was under the wrong impression that if I maintain it to a certain circle that I can hide it from the Secret Service, which, of course, is baloney. <laughs> they knew already, of course. 
So uh, there were two friends of mine. And then the first evening with this Kung Fu teacher, I had one room of my apartment completely uh, turned into a training room. Had, of course, also from a flea market in Poland, a post of Bruce Lee there, some nunchucks hanging on the walls, some throwing stars. So Chinese, Japanese, Korean, it was all thrown in there. It didn't matter. It had to be look Asian and martial arts. And then he looked at my wall bag and there was a little bit of blood on it. And he said, hey, that's a good start. Uh, the punching bag looks a little bit bloody. I must say this Kung Fu teacher, he prior to that, to this profession, he had been a professional boxer. So in Chinese Kung Fu is Chinese boxing. So and then we first evening asked him, can you show us a little bit? Because we were still in awe. There's from the West. He made it even across. He was willing to teach us. Can you show us some something? He said, yeah, well, uh, give me a punch. Swing at me. And we said, yeah, which one of us? Three. He said, oh, well, all three of you, if you want. We, <laughs> because we were, <laughs> we were 20. And a 50-year-old, if you're 20, somebody who's 50, it's kind of, well, okay, he knows Kung Fu, but he's already pretty old. Okay, so kind of half whispering, let's take it easy on him. So the three of us made a move, and the next moment we were all three on the floor. And he still had one hand in his pocket, so kind of with the other hand, so one sniff across the nose. Oh, okay, you guys can get up again. And we, wait a minute, what the heck just happened? And he said, yeah, if you want to try again, we tried it again. And uh, because he was a former professional boxer, he said, so anything above the belt uh, up to the throat is, of course, full punching power allowed. And he whacked us. Uh, he whacked us for real. And we went down and we thought that was the coolest thing ever. A Kung Fu master. He wasn't one yet in the traditional meaning. He was only a Kung Fu teacher. But for us, he was a, a Kung Fu master. Just knocked us twice on our butts. How cool is that? And since... Uh, we were the first ones. I had started it, uh, so I started. I continued then from this first seminar on teaching Kung Fu. So that day, 1985, I wanted to inv invite him again. Before that, he visited his family and near East Berlin. So and he said, then only months later after this, after this first initial seminar in Rostock, he said, visit me there and there in East Berlin. And I did it. And then oh, in the memory, it's now really great. But this day I had uh, a tooth was going off and I could barely get my teeth together. I had a toothache in my uh, head. It was all throbbing. But I thought, I have to go. I cannot miss this in a second meeting with my Kung Fu teacher. And I arrived there. What happens? One of the family members was in East Germany, a boxing coach. So he now, having been the Kung Fu teacher, a formal professional boxer, and a Kung Fu teacher. So now the boxing coach said, can you show me some of your stuff and how this Kung Fu stuff is better than regular boxing? Yeah, who was there to show it on? Me. <laughs> <laughs> I was the one. So then, of course, Leo said, yeah, okay, Ralph, uh, okay, give me a ride. And I was on the inside moaning and groaning because I had this pain. It was like I, I almost felt light in my head so and then bam i get the first across the jaw and i saw the stars i've never seen them again like this the whole tooth uh, where my jaw was swollen where the infection was it was with one hit it was all open and gone <laughs> So oh, it wow. was the one second dentist treatment on yeah. the street. And then he showed for several hours. Okay, try to get me like this. Okay, try to wrestle me to the ground. And he showed everything. So at this day, I passed my first 
end, my second student test, and he had even smuggled the certificates already over. So I guess he must have thought, well, this dude is training hard. Uh, um, I might as well give them to me. And then I remember the drive back in the evening. I could put my teeth together and I couldn't feel anything anymore. No pain, nothing. Everything was gone. But I had a little bit problem breathing. I put my shirt up, my whole upper body, everything. Well, what do we have in a rainbow? It was blue. It was green. It was red. It was yellow. There was some brown. There was also already some black there. Uh, for days, I could barely breathe. So if a former professional boxer wakes you for several hours with, you can't see my fingers now, for light contact... Mm -hmm. uh, you feel it, but I was so proud of it. So and then I wanted to invite him again, and suddenly I got from the Interior Ministry a letter, the citizen of the Federal Republic, uh, Leo Zech, can not be accepted into our country anymore. Uh, all the best, something like this. I thought, what? This can be. So now they had caught on that I was teaching, that I had met twice a Kung Fu teacher to the West. So now they were trying to restrict this. So I was, of course, trying to uh, reach my this uh, head of the, the chief instructor of the European organization of this martial arts organization. And uh, now people say, yeah, okay, you called him. What's next? But we touched uh, very quickly upon phones in the beginning. Just calling somebody from the east and the west is not as easy. So in Rostock, I had to go in the morning to the post office and say, uh, I want to apply for a phone call to this and this number. And then hopefully you had a lot of sandwiches packed. And then you had to wait there and wait. And typically, until you got your phone connection, it took anything from five to six, seven, eight hours then late afternoon, suddenly, your call to the Langzell Castle near Heidelberg, Western Germany. Yes, yes, yes. And then I ran into the phone cabin. So with those old padded doors. Yeah, of course, we know now the padding was only that people who walked by couldn't hear anything. The Secret Service was uh, listening in on all the calls anyway to the West because there were only five, six, seven telephone lines from the East into the West and all of them were checked. So I had waited, let's say, sounds good, seven hours for this phone call approximately. So I came in there and said, yes, hello, here is Ravenel from, from Rostock, from East Germany. And she, whoa, 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 um, this is the wife of the chief. And so he's just left for dinner in the city. Can you call again in an hour or so? No. <laughs> So it was very difficult. How do you explain somebody what you're going through to just make one simple phone call? So eventually I got him again and again. It was every time the same. I had it then already. I worked in a hotel around the corner from the post office in Rostock that I went before work in there said, okay, can you put me down for this phone number in the West? And can you then call the reception uh, at the hotel? And since they got their lunch at the post office from us, he said, no worries. And then I had told my co-worker, so if a call comes in, then I have to, uh, at this very moment, run out. And then afternoon, it's five, six, seven, eight hours later, a call came, your connection is there to the West. So I ran out of the hotel, ran across the street, past people and into the post office, into the phone cabin. So this is how a phone call worked. So a year later, he said, can you invite somebody from West Berlin? Because not many people might know it. As a East German citizen, you had to invite a West German citizen via the Ministry of the Interior officially. So per letter, you had to fill out forms for a day, you had to in the West fill out forms. A West Berliner could just as a tourist get into East Berlin, could not have left, left East Berlin, but a West Berliner could just come into East Berlin in the morning, say, hey, I want to go to a museum because of the four power status of all of Berlin. 
so he, the chief instructor of the Kung Fu organization, then said, um, yes, so he would come over as a tourist and will continue teaching me. So now I was standing there in the morning uh, in 1986 for the first time. He had written to me, let's not meet directly at the border point. And I thought, cool idea. Then we don't show up on the cameras. Then they might not supervise us, uh, control us. Uh, forget it. It was all before that arranged anyway. But I found out about this much, much later. So he said, I have this blue kind of beige uh, leather jacket so, and just like in a movie, he came out of the uh, station near the Palace of Tears. We, I looked from across the street. He nodded. I nodded. We both looked very serious. Then we walked. So as a, I do not know this person on the other side of the street, met up somewhere. Then I said, oh, yeah, wow, great to meet you. And uh, I said, okay, how do we get there? Because it was at my parents' place in East Berlin where the secret training was supposed to happen. I said, okay, we'll take a cab, a taxi. For once, we got one. Taxis were also very rare. Uh, we took the taxi to another place that just in case somebody follows us, we leave this taxi here, one station with the S-Bahn, and then we take another taxi. <laughs> then we've shaken any tail off what could have happened. They were already waiting for us, uh, as I found out much, much later. <laughs> so it was all for nothing, trying to shake off the Secret Service tail. But we did it, and back then we found uh, we found it so cool, and I thought, wow. I'm really, I'm beating the Secret Service. I am doing things here, all kinds of steps. Man, I'm on a roll. <laughs> it's happening. And then he taught me a couple of times more. And he always said, one time he came with his wife and his newborn son. And he said, yeah, just taking in the sights, visiting this museum. So he came disguised as a day tourist into East Berlin, had to leave before midnight so that he doesn't get into trouble. And then I had once again do a Kung Fu test. And uh, I thought, man, uh, how will he do this? And he said, don't worry. At the end of the evening, I got your certificate with me. And since he was also checked at the border, I said, how did you do this? How did you get my Kung Fu certificate into East Berlin? He said, I put it at the very bottom of the diaper bag. So um, at the uh, in the morning, <laughs> he then told me the story. Mm -hmm. The bo East German Border Patrol give us this bag, and he, yeah, sure, okay, we have to check everything. He, <laughs> oh, please do and clean it out. He said I was just on the other side here, yeah, West Berlin Customs, and had to uh, change the diaper of my baby son. <laughs> so please, this bag is not quite as airtight as I thought. The East German looked just with a grim uh, face at him. Take it, go. <laughs> and waved mm -hmm. him through this door with the buzzer back then, this uh, where you could get through the door and then you were in the east. And this is how on a full baby diaper, he smuggled my Kung Fu certificate into the east. <laughs> so uh, I still keep it <laughs> and know what story is connected to it. So I had to fight hard for it, but also under what circumstances it made a border crossing. So, yeah, who would believe something today? No, exactly, exactly. Now, in late spring 1988, a colleague, and I'm presuming this is a work colleague of yours, introduces you to a uh, girl. Hey, Karama, yes. <laughs> now, I'm going to leave you on a bit of a cliffhanger there because uh, it's a good point at which to break Ralph's story. The next episode talks about his arrest by the Stasi and his interrogation, so make sure you look out for that. And we have further information such as videos and links in our show notes, which will show as a link in your podcast app. Now, you wouldn't be listening to this podcast without the generous support of our patrons. However, I want to especially thank our Politburo level members who are contributing a generous 30 US dollars a month to keep us on the air. They are Tony Sowards, Sam Hardwick, Nicholas Butter, Jeffrey Jones, Matthew Comstock, Mark Labance, Frederick Esposito, 
Jack Madwed and Peter Ryan. Don't forget, if you like one of those Cold War Conversations coasters and help support the show, then head over to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. If you can't wait for the next episode, please visit our Facebook discussion group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War Conversation. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thank you very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye.